Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, nice to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Trotter, and I am the Dean of the Logic and Rhetoric School here at the Oaks. And with me today, I have Mr. Matt Dykstra, who is one of our science teachers at the Logic and Rhetoric School, along with Mr. Joel Dowers, uh, also one of our teachers. We're glad to be with you, and we're excited to, sh to share some information today about the Oaks Science Program. We want to give you an update. So let me pray for us and then we'll get started hopefully giving you some information that uh, will help you uh, as we move ahead. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day, uh, for your kindness, uh, for your goodness. Uh, Lord, your word tells us that you are a good God and we see that each and every day. In the midst of what we're going through, Lord, we, we give you praise because we know that you're directing our steps and that all things work together for good. And so, Lord, um, thank you for this time that we have as well. And thank you for, um, uh, for allowing us to share some information about the Oaks. We're so grateful for the Oaks uh, Classical Christian Academy and uh, for the past year and for what you're doing here. So, Lord, as we share information, help us to be clear and concise and help us to share information that will be helpful to our, our parents, Lord. Again, I thank you for these gentlemen and for this school. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, thanks for being with us. And uh, <laughs> let me start off with a question, gentlemen. Um, what are the changes that the Oaks Science uh, Program is making for the 2020-21 school year? Okay, really great. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, well, we back up just a little bit. We've, we've taught life science at sixth grade. We're going to take... Uh, what has been about three days a week of life science and make that five days a week. And so we're bolstering our life science class in the sixth grade. Uh, seventh grade has been an earth science class. So we're gonna to continue to teach earth science at the seventh grade level. Eighth grade has never had a science class at the Oaks. And so we're super excited that uh, eighth grade is gonna have a science class. It will be a, a basic science, a general science, a, a, a physics and chemistry sort of science. Um, that will prepare the kids for the, the chemistry biology that's coming subsequently. So uh, ultimately when we're done implementing uh, this, this, uh, these changes, it's going to be a seven, uh, sixth grade life science, full-time, uh, five days a week, seventh grade earth science, and eighth grade uh, physical science, physics and chemistry. And then uh, we'll have a chemistry, fit, uh, uh, chemistry biology, uh, ninth and 10th, 11th is gonna be uh, a physics class. We're going to ultimately have uh, our 12th grade physics class move to 11th grade. And then that's going to open up uh, space for a history and philosophy of science class. Where, um, it'll, it'll be a blessing that the kids will get to understand the nature of science at the, at the senior level. And that's going to be Joel yep. uh, teaching that. Very good. What, what kind of an impact will that change, a little bit change in sequence, have on the field trips that you take? because I know you take some field trips connected to some of our science classes. So tell me a little bit about that. That's a great question. So seventh grade has, it has the Mount St. Helens trip. So there will be no impact to the seventh grade field trip. Okay. And then as we slide biology down, it, the biology field trip to Yellowstone will, will, be, uh, uh, will be running concurrent with that bio, with, okay. with the biology yeah. class. So we're gonna keep the field trips connected to the particular classes that um, we've had in the past. Correct. Okay, yep. great. And um, Joel, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think what we're really excited about in this change um, and being able to switch classes around, um, as Matt just told you, was the first one is being able to bring uh, science, a science teacher down full time in the sixth grade and be able to bolster that and uh, get the students um, prepared um, for when they get into junior high. So preparing them beforehand and making that rigorous. Um, and then also as we carry that forward um, with eighth grade and seventh grade, being able to kind of set the foundation for what they will be doing in high school. So being very intentional and in saying, these are the basic principles at a logic level that you will then be applying in the rhetoric level. Um, and so we get all the way through, we're trying to bring those closer together. And then ultimately with the history and philosophy of science class senior year, um, the goal there is to um, contextualize all of the sciences together. Um, what we've been doing is we've been teaching the disciplines, we've been 
um, teaching those um, according to um, current theories. We've been bringing students along so they understand how to do science in the different disciplines. And the history and philosophy class is to contextualize that in the broader concept. Um, so what are the worldviews driving it? Um, it's not just science and reason going alone, but there are worldviews behind it. So what we're trying to do is to give students an understanding of what they're going to face as soon as they come out into the world. How do I think about science and the evidence that is gathered from it in context to philosophy and in context to theology? Um, so that's really our goal. Um, as Dr. Mitch Stokes out of um, Moscow says, he's a professor of philosophy, is that he wants it to be sober skeptics. We want our students to come across a piece of evidence and say, is this true or is it false? Is this um, follow a Christian worldview or a different worldview? And what we're really trying to do is allow our students to say, I believe this to be true and this not, and to not get swept up in what can happen as far as science today. So we're really trying to um, develop as an overall goal the intuition that God has given all of us. What, what is right? What is wrong? How do we view God? And so it's trying to frame it all the way from K through 12th um, in both classes, uh, the humanities and the sciences, trying to bridge those and bring them together. So when students come out, they're able to say, this is true science, this is false, and it's based on a false conclusion. Um, so we're really trying to prepare them um, for the world that they're going to face. Um, so it accomplishes uh, those two goals of contextualizing and developing that intuition um, that we want our students to have to be discerning once they get out into the world. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. That's excellent. We want them to think. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah. Absolutely. We want them to think. Good. So um, in thinking about the changes, um, that we're that we're making what would you say or how would you phrase what are the goals uh, what is the goal of the science program here at the Oaks okay yeah so um, we want to have we want to have students that understand the science and the science content very well and I think all schools want that for their students right that's 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 a pretty standard uh, scientific endeavor. Right? We understand the content of science. Uh, we also want students to, to be good scientists. We want them to have good lab skills. We want them to be able to work with data and understand uh, you know, what is this data suggesting about the world. And uh, so we want them to um, want them to be we want them to be good scientists working with good content. Well, we also uh, we want them to understand the nature of what science is, and that really speaks to this uh, this history and philosophy of science class at the senior level, recognizing that that uh, data is important in science, but we always put science into a into a context of a greater worldview. Uh, and so, what is the philosophy? What's the worldview that's driving your interpretation of the data? So. Um, what we want here at the Oaks is students understanding um, uh, the content, the, the, you know, the, um, the, 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 the facts, the rules, the laws of science. We want the kids uh, to know how to, how to work as, as scientists in the lab. We want kids to contextualize it within a worldview and recognize multiple worldviews uh, that, that are at play. You know, what, what is an evolutionist thing versus a creationist? And what's the greater worldview around around those so that's that's really our, our third point and then our fourth point is to, to to set it in a biblical worldview to recognize that that everything that we're seeing is declaring the glory of god right? this is speaking this is uh, everything that we see around us in in the scientific world in the creative world is, is speaking who god is and so we want our students to graduate from here understanding that god has made everything um, um, understanding that there's a that there's a worldview that uh, that the world puts uh, that secular scientists put data into that does not line up with with uh, with a biblical worldview, and so we want want kids to be good songs, strong, strong scientists and think like think like Christians. Um, and when you're when you're talking, one of the things that, that popped up to me was or thoughts that I had was um, we have lab based sciences here at the Oaks. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about a little bit about um, what goes on in a typical lab. Um, you know one that you have, how, how, um, how in depth do you, are you able to go in, in some of your dissections or what, what kind of labs do we have here? Yeah, I would say that we have a variety of labs. You okay. know, uh, there are the, I think we've probably all been through high school, 
science class where there's you get your you get your lab right up and you know there's the paragraph that tells you what you're going to be doing and then there's the step by step by step kind of a cookie cutter lab you know and then there's a preformed data table and then the questions and, and i remember doing those in high school and thinking what am, why am i doing this right yeah. and so we want to we want to get our kids out of that type of lab so uh, there is a time and a place for for that type of lab but i want my students to be thinking about why am i what is my end goal? What am I trying to figure out in this lab? What steps do I need to get there? And what materials do I have to do it? Uh, and so you know, many times we'll have students generate the lab report or the lab protocol with us. You know, the, what, what steps are we going to be doing to, in order to demonstrate this aspect of, of, of the world? And so, uh, you know, sometimes they're, sometimes they're creating their steps. Uh, sometimes uh, the steps are, are set in front of them uh, in a way that doesn't just tell them what to do. Sometimes I just, I hand my students, like I do an Archimedes, uh, Archimedes density lab, and I, say, I hand my students the three different samples. I give them gravel, I give them painted gravel that looks like gold, and I give them copper that I call real gold. And I tell them, after the story of what Archimedes did, when he entered the bathtub and saw his water displacement, you know, the water displacement, determine his volume. Uh, I tell them that story. I don't give them the hints. I don't tell them how to do the lab. I give them these materials and open up my cabinets, you know, for a few other pieces of material like triple beam balances and graduated cylinders. And I say, you guys prove to me or you guys tell me, you know, what, what is, uh, what's the real gold, what's not the real gold. I mean, obviously the kids can see what's the real gold and what's not the real gold, but they have to, they have to generate the numbers to be able to, to, to show it to me. And so they'll sit there and they'll scratch their head and like, uh, how are we going to do this? And within four or five minutes, they're off and running. They're taking measurements. It becomes clearer and clearer to them. And in a 45 minute hour long session, bam, they've got their answer and they've figured it out themselves, which is so fun. We'll do, uh, we'll do mousetrap cars and egg drops where um, you know, they've got some basic materials and some basic rules. And then you go create, you go build. So I would say we run, we run the gamut from, from more of, uh, of a few cookbooky labs to uh, hopefully a lot more of the, uh, the students working through and generating and, and determining what are the steps and how is this gonna work and how do I deal with the data in a way that makes it, makes it thoughtful. And that's also one of the big reasons for us to um, come in back to eighth grade and put a science class there. We're finding that we're spending time introducing um, uh, chemistry concepts or physics concepts or biology concepts um, that the students, if they already knew, we could take the labs and we could give them more time to investigate. Our, our goal is to have students understand the concepts in order for them to ask questions. We want them to have that time. And what we realized is for that, we, they needed space. They needed more time. So class times going from 45 minutes to 55 minutes helped. Um, putting the basic concepts in the logic stage where they're really helpful will help them get into the rhetoric stage and they're able to ask a question and then spend time investigating um, and so they have all of the means available to them um, as Matt's describing with the Archimedes lab and trying to come um, around them and give them um, days to not only um, have a question and an answer but have that answer fail and then realize oh I, I can go back and change it um, and that that ability to fail and try um, and come up on their own is something that we think is just vitally important for all scientists and we want them to be inquisitive we want them to love it and i think by um, putting that in eighth grade getting the basic concepts they can really delve into it in the high school so uh, that's what we're looking for and you bring up a good point on failing you know some labs many labs don't fit in a 45 minute session no, right you know uh, science doesn't fit in a, in a in a 45 minute block you know mythbusters is not reality you know they they work for weeks and months on those on those, yeah, exactly. those types of things and so our students need to understand that you know they're going to do a lab during a class and it utterly fall apart and then they get the next class they get the next class period the next day to take another go at things and okay now we've got it figured out now we're now we're seeing data that that makes sense so and that's how that scientist actually did it that's, <laughs> that's right that's how it works you fail many times you it's not i think we can train our students with those cookie cutter labs or just giving them data that they always assume that the right answer they'll be given the right answer at the end and that's just not the nature of science they're investigating blindly out there using the best um theories and data available and we find most theories are wrong and then we improve and improve so um, the more we can drive that home to them uh, i think the better scientists they will make excellent 
I want to back up to the field trips again mm -hmm. as we talk about labs. Yeah. And is would it be true to say that taking them on a field trip like to um, to Yellowstone would be to uh, would it be kind of like taking them into the lab? so to speak does that does that make any sense that we're mm -hmm. we're taking him into this this realm where we can uh open up a world to them that we can continue to build on yeah. as the year goes on but yeah. we're actually walking into a lab would that be yeah be yeah the case? yeah i'd say the distinction the difference would be that we're not walking into a lab and we're we're, we're generating data and we're and we're trying to you know look into this unknown part of the world and figure out you know from our data what it is i think what the field trips do is set up set a context for the for the for the year to run along so going to mount st helens uh we get rock types and magma and plate tectonics and uh, uh, uh glaciers and, and mountain ranges that we cross over and there is uh, there is so much that i can pull out over the next semester for mm -hmm. uh for um yeah for the for the earth science study so we'll be in you know we'll be in about the you know, the, the 15th week of the semester, and I'll, be, and I'll still be referring back to Mount St. Helens. Do you remember when we saw such and such at Mount St. Helens? Do you remember when we crested that hill, we came into this incredible U-shaped valley and it was just huge? Well, what, what, what did I tell you carved that valley? You know, uh, we can have those types of conversations. So it puts us in a place where the kids have the sense of awe and wonder. They've seen where we've been. They've been delighted by where we've been. They've smelled, you know, tasted, touched you know, dove into in some cases, you know, and experienced, uh, experienced tactilely in such a way that we can pull it back out of them, which is, I think, a little bit different than in the lab, where it's, where the lab is both tactile, but also data driven. We're not able, we have not been able to figure out a way to, to generate data on these field trips, although that's a great point. We can look for that. Yeah, I would say there are more observations when we're out there as the last experiment. So we are trying to figure how to do that and then we don't have Andy here with us but he takes the physics trips um, and so our physics students go over and see the University of Washington and talk to the professors there um, see some demonstrations look at a pharmaceutical company um, history of or the flight museum and when they're over there um, they're interacting with people and kind of having little debates going back and forth but even then it's more observational um, when we're out on the field trips um, it just brings context to what's going on. It's mm -hmm. vital being out there in nature. Uh, it's good to get them out. They, yeah. they, they, they like being out and they should, and that helps drive their um, inquiry into, okay, what's going on? It's not just the classroom. Let's, let's expand it outside of the classroom. And they do, field trips are great for that. Things come alive, yeah. you know, when you see the, the colorful bacterial mats at Yellowstone. And, and you know, to talk about bacteria in the, in the classroom, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's ethereal, you know, it's like, I can't see a bacteria, how do I know it's there? I'm told to wash my hands, that sort of thing. But, you know, here they walked, uh, you know, along Grand Prismatic Hot Spring, and, you know, they see all the colors of the rainbow there on these, on these, on these living mats, you know, and they realize these, they can't see the individual bacteria, but they know they're there, right? You know, they can see the effects of them, and, and then you get back into the lab, and bacteria just have to have a, have a closer connection with them, or they've seen roaring mountain, you know, steaming and hissing, and, you know, the mountain is just, it's just it's it's barren in that spot yeah, because you have uh, the bacteria doing the work that they're doing, and it you know, makes an acid which destroys the forest. And these things come alive to the kids. That's really good. Yeah, wonderful. Do me a favor. Um, each of you have been teaching here for the Oaks for a good bit. I know uh, you've been here for a long. Yeah, time. a very small bit, yeah, a very small large bit. bit. Yes. Give us a little bit of your background um, okay. and share that with us so that we can kind of. See gotcha. how how much why you love science so much. Gotcha. Well, mid mid coffee, Joel. Do you want to go first? Uh, I will go first. Um, so I was actually taught by Matt um, back in the day. So he's been doing it for a long time and helped instill in me get excitement for it. Um, and so I, I graduated from the Oaks, uh, went through the science um, program, and ended up going on into college and getting into human anatomy and physiology, and became an exercise physiologist um, and so that was my goal uh, and that was my focus for study is um, seeing how biology and chemistry come together that's the physiology um, how do things work um, on the inside that we can't see and the basis of it is chemistry but it's chemistry and um, biology coming together and in and, and symbiotic relationship and so that's what I was doing and that's what I went on to 
Um, B is an exercise physiology uh, physiologist who worked in cardiac and pulmonary rehab. Um, but along the way, um, I was able to teach a little bit in college and was part of a research um, company um, when I was down at Cal Poly. And down, when I was down there, I got into the researching and how does research work and how does data, how does evidence come together? And so it kind of matched that love that I had of chemistry and biology with um, evidence and how do we come and how do we create and what can we conclude from studies and what can't we conclude? Um, and so I, I was excited by that, excited by the teaching. Um, when I was a physiologist, I was able to teach down there and that's what I found that I liked more um, than the clinical aspect that was enjoyable. Um, helping people, finding a problem. Um, they came with a problem, finding a solution and doing it through exercise. So I enjoyed that portion of it, but I really gravitated more towards the teaching. Um, and then I was able, invited to come back and teach at my alma mater and teach with Matt. Um, and it was just a, a delightful opportunity and one that we wanted most, I would have to say most, to put our kids in the school. That was my primary goal. Um, and then secondary has been this, and it's been able to I've been able to develop um, the ability to teach alongside Matt and kind of delve into what is the teaching side of it and how do we um, how do we pass this on to the next generation? Take the love that we both have um, and instill that in the students, along with the understanding of actually how to do science, how to, how to how to take evidence, how to know the limits of evidence, and how to pursue it, and all in the context that we want to. Um, glorify God in it. There are, um, there's so much in the world to understand and we want to help students go out and find the part that enthuses them the most and to delve into it and do it all to the glory of God and to um, make change. And so that's um, how I ended up here and ended up being able to teach chemistry and biology and then history and philosophy of science really has interested me um, recently. Um, what's, what's the context? What are um, all the arguments that we have today? They didn't just come out of any, anywhere. Um, what, what was it? Um, how did it get here? How did we get to science in this regard? Um, what was it beforehand? How do you get Newton to now, the glory age of natural philosophy in the 17th century? Um, and trying to figure out what was the good parts of that to pull forward and uh, um, put together with the incredible advances in science. And how do we make that? all to the glory of God. And so that's um, where I'm at now and what makes me excited to teach and be with these gentlemen. So, yeah. Good. And this past year was the first year that we offered uh, history of, and philosophy of science class. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. And it was a semester class that you're looking in the future to having as a full year. Yeah. Right. It is. And so we got, we were able to pilot it. I had um, students come in and volunteer to be the first class. And what came out of that uh, was really a time to, like I said earlier, contextualize. The students were bringing in what they found in philosophy, what they were talking about in literature and history, and realizing that there is a whole narrative um, of science that they can't quite understand without that context. And so um, knowing what, uh, a revolution is, how, how does it come about? How does science progress? It's not just an inexorable wheel that grinds out truth, but it's more like a, a teenage kid or just any human. It makes mistakes, it, uh, it messes up, things get lost for 300 years. Uh, you've got examples of scientific writings on vellum getting ripped apart because nobody cares anymore about it and used to make um, something and then people find it 300 years later and it's a, it's a rebirth of knowledge and you just you just see how how humans interact um, but it really grounds in today the creation evolution um, what is the nature um, how much should we believe science um, and so it really um, was a delight to teach them and I'll be honest they, I learned as much from them as they did for me um, and try to uh, talk it through and say what's how, how should this work best and so um, I'm, I think it's, it's, it's the right direction to, to change it and have our students come out with their eyes wide open and saying, this is what I should be doing and this is how I um, should, what I should be wary of, going back to that sober skeptic. Don't believe everything. Don't be unduly credulous, uh, but just actually figure out what's, what's going together. So. Good. Matt, share a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I was uh, raised by two educators and most of our family friends were teachers and so it was just around and um, my parents took me uh, 
really around the world uh, over the course of about six summers where we just traveled for the entire summer. And so I saw a lot of God's beauty all over the, all over the world, really. And, and so by about third grade, uh, I had decided that I wanted to be a science teacher. And, uh, you know, my parents let me play with electricity and water in my room doing electrolysis experiments. I still can't believe they let me do that. <laughs> now I didn't die. And, <laughs> and it just, it was really fun. So, um, I think seeing the world being raised by educators, uh, having freedom to, to play uh, with with these with these things of science. I had my chemistry set, you know, as a you know fourth fifth grader, and I remember filling the basement up with smoke. And uh, it was just it was I don't know. So it's just been there for a long long time. I, I think in in college I, I did some research. I, I worked with Swimmers Itch. I worked with um, with uh, with uh, bottom dwelling algae in like Michigan and aquatic plants and and there was a bit of point where I had to decide you know, am I going to be a researcher or am I going to be a science, a science teacher and and just I, I it just I just kept falling back towards science teaching and so um, moved uh, moved from here I uh, moved from Michigan out here in uh, 1997 and saw what was going on at the Oaks and said this, this is amazing what's happening at this school and, and I want to be a part of it so I shifted from wanting to be a, a public school teacher to a Christian school teacher and uh, and, and yeah, I've been here for 21 years, pretty much, <laughs> ever since. So that's it's great. Good. 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 Well, thank you both for sharing mm -hmm. a little bit about your past. There's a question that uh, has come up uh, several times when you, anytime you talk about science in a Christian world, you normally have something like this, uh, this question. But it says, if y'all will respond to this, how do you teach science in, the, in a world that sees a distinction between science and faith? Mm -hmm. So how how do you teach science Christian school school in a world that sees a distinction between science and faith? How would you respond to that? Well, the first one. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would say that God made a universe, not a not a multiverse. God is the God of it all. It, it all it all fits together. And so we can't uh, we can't make a distinction between well you know there's the, there's there's the Bible and then there's science and both are equally true. They're, they've got to be inextricably linked and, and I've had conversations with scientists you know uh, uh, you know that this is uh, you know that, that you can just remove the bible from your science class and just teach the science it doesn't work that way that can't be possible so uh, I, I think it comes down to uh, comes down to grounding the kids in scripture you know like like we go back to uh, Romans 120 Psalm 19 uh, Col uh, Colossians 117 you know, that this world is the Lord's you know, right. in the Psalms. It, that there are a few pillar verses, those, those verses I want my kid, I want my students, um, you know, that when they leave here, those are the verses they know about. And so, um, so that they have a biblical, a strong biblical understanding, you know, that, that the wisdom that they see in, in science, the wisdom that we understand in, you know, an atomic model or uh, in the, you know, in the laws of nature, those are God's foundationally. And then I think it's critical that God has brought both Joel and I on a journey to, uh, to understand that history and philosophy of science is so critical. You know, that um, Isaac, Bacon, you know, Isaac Newton, uh, 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 Francis Bacon, Galileo, uh, Faraday, uh, these early scientists were not atheistic. They were, uh, they were uh, you know, seeking to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. Right. You know? And so when we understand that, uh, that science was really birthed in a Christian world. You know, that, it, that um, the ancient Chinese, that you know, even they had an incredible culture. That you know, the golden age of Islam was an incredible culture. Uh, Greece and Rome of the ancient day, they were incredible. They were advanced. They had they had steam engines in ancient Greece. You know, and and, the, and really the question would be why why wasn't Nero launching people to the moon? Because that's about the right amount of time between the steam engine and, and Nero. You know, and, and it comes back to the Greeks didn't have the right worldview to pursue a, a scientific revolution. They didn't get there because there were things that were fundamentally missing in their, in their thoughts. Um, you know, the scientific revolution came out of, out of a Christian soil. And so when we see that it's, uh, it's Christians that move science forward, that it's a Christian philosophy that science was developed in, that it's birthed in, that it's a robust understanding uh, you know, a robust picture of the world. Uh, I think that that bolsters kids' understanding of, of, of what science is uh, and, and really fights against those uh, methodological uh, and philosophical naturalists and materialists who say that we can reduce the world down to atoms and molecules. There's so much more mm -hmm. to this world than just a reductionist approach of, of 
materialism and naturalism. Good. Yeah, good. Cool. Yeah, and so uh, picking up right there, that's um, our, our, one of our main goals um, with science is the, I, the way I, I like to view it is there's kind of three different realms uh, of knowledge. So we have science. The science aspect is we're investigating God's um, revelation, what, what he's given to us um, that has since the creation fallen. So we're, we're, we use science to go out and make sense of the world that we can see, keeping in mind that it is a fallen world. So that's the kind of that goal for science. Um, and then we've got philosophy and kind of the humanities. And the goal there is to um, look at that same revelation. What has the God given us? Our minds, our ability to think. And we're looking at the abstract parts of God's direct revelation. So um, we've got science to look at the physical portions, and we've got philosophy and the humanities to look at the abstract portions. And then the third part to that, which is indispensable, is God's direct revelation. And we view that, or we're able to understand that through th theology and the Bible, right? So we need all three of those coming together. And as Matt said, most uh, way that now is, the, the way the world currently is, is science is completely reductionistic. You take it all the way down to the, to the basic chemicals, and then you can build up, and you're able to explain not only all of the physical things, but all of your um, philosophical and all of God, right? They, they build it up into science can dictate everything you've got. Sam Harris now with neuroscience saying that that explains emotions, that explains um, higher thinking, that explains our morality. Um, and so you have um, nowadays science being taught as the author of all knowledge. Um, it's grown out of its small little place or it's, it's, or it's a large place, but it's a large place in relation to the other two, philosophy and theology. And so what happened is science has grown up and taken over um, everything. And so what are, we really want our students to see is that science is contained to what it can talk about, um, what it's actually able to investigate the physical world. Um, and we don't want it to overbear, uh, have the truth from there start being the only avenue of truth. There's, there's two other ones. And so getting that context and really limiting science to what it can speak to and then pursuing it wholeheartedly in that aspect because it's not just knowledge for knowledge sake, but it actually tells us about God because we can um, see his, uh, his actual creation. There's a, one of my favorite quotes by Aldo Leopold is, um, and I might, I'm gonna paraphrase, but it's in, in dire necessity, someone could write the new Iliad, a new, another Iliad. Someone could paint another Michelangelo, but fashion a goose, you can't, that's God's. And so when we go out and we have science, it is a very strong portion of God's truth that we need to investigate. And our job from the garden, the dominion mandate, is to look and create and create and create. We want to develop better models, have a deeper understanding. Um, and so I think that's the, our goal. And what they'll find, the students, as soon as they come out, that they'll have a Richard Dawkins idea, which is what he, in one of his quotes is, I don't believe in religion because it makes us settle for where we're at. We, we don't need to investigate. God has done it. Um, and I think that's just completely the wrong view of what history shows and what Christians are in our job. And so that's um, putting that in the context and making it um, more robust is, is our goal. And so instead of drawing distinctions, we're, probably, we're trying to, to, to bring them together when you're trying to, to, to see that science sits on that bed of theology. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Good. Good. Um, just in, in closing this portion to see if there, we'll see if there's any questions um, that, that come up, but um, I want to go back to the beginning when we started talking about the changes in the, in the, uh, the Oak Science Program and just ask us, let's, let's um, ask the question again, what are those changes? And let's just kind of summarize with some of those changes one more time. Okay. Does that make sense? Just to, to make sure we all are getting the picture of what's where we're moving with the Oaks Science Program. Gotcha. So could you guys do that one more time to summarize that? Yeah. Yeah, in a nutshell, we're expanding sixth grade life science. Right. We are creating an eighth grade science class. Right. And then um, we're moving the high school classes down one. Okay. So that we can get a history and philosophy of science class at the end. So we six, uh, sixth grade class, an eighth grade class, and a uh, uh, history and philosophy of science 
class uh, to, to, to put a bow on the students when they, before they walk out the door. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and then I just saw there's a question, are the incoming 10th graders going to be learning biology instead of chemistry? Um, and what we're talking about is going to be slowly rolled out. So our change is gonna be in eighth grade. And then as that class progresses, um, these changes will be made. So in response to that question, um, the, the, the incoming 10th graders are going to still be doing chemistry. They're, they're in the, the same form. So a 10th grader will take chemistry and then an 11th, it'll be biology and then physics or history and philosophy of science. So that doesn't change. It's an eighth grade that they're going to um, then take basic science and then ninth grade um, will be chemistry or biology and going forward. So none of those changes will take place um, or it will all occur with eighth grade rolling forward. Yeah, but that's a good question. It's a good question. Um, Looks like we, do we get another one? We've got another one. Um, and so I think it would be a similar response to biology and physics. The, so this, the, question? the students will currently follow the normal path. Um, so 10th graders will then go in 11th grade, take biology, and then physics will be um, senior year, and then there's the option to take history and philosophy of science. Good. Yeah, so everyone 9th grade and above is going to be the norm. Exactly. It's just exactly what we've been doing in the past, right. uh, starting with this, this grade, 8th grade, this year's 8th grade class. Those are the rollout changes. Yeah. But there has been discussion about looking at the content of each of those courses to enrich those as well. Absolutely. Right. And so that's, that's another, uh, I would say, very slight modification because our courses are rich as they are, but just to see, can we do, can we um, further enhance the, what our students are learning in each of those classes? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's really good. Stay up to me. Yeah, you know, another thing that's going to be helpful with that is that we're going to have hour-long classes right. you know, instead of 45-minute classes. So, yes. So, I mean, every teacher every year experiences these, but I wanted to get to it gets to there, yeah. right? So hour-long classes plus what we can back back right into into the sixth grade, into the seventh grade, into the eighth grade to help you know Joel get where he wants to go in chemistry, get where he wants to go in biology, to help Andy get where he wants to go in physics. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got another question on their science fair. Um, will there continue to be science fair class? Yes. Did y'all want to chat about that? Uh, I don't feel qualified right now. Okay. Chat about that. Do you want to well, that one? The, the science fair class is going to be included in um, one of our courses. And right now we're evaluating as to which it would be the best course to include that in. But um, we will still have a science fair at the Oaks. It'll just, again, be a part of one of our courses. So, so not a separate class. Not a separate class, right. Let's see if there are there any other questions. Doesn't look like anything right now. Can you gentlemen think of a, a question that um, should be asked mm -hmm. if you were a parent? Well, we both are, so. Yeah. <laughs> Can you think? Your, your kids are older. Yeah. So, so, I'm so close. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard to yeah. think about it because you are so close to it. Um, what about the impact? We talked about the um, uh, shifting from 45 minutes to 55 minutes. I think some parents would ask the question about how would that, how is that going to impact homework time mm -hmm. in science? Um, have you thought about that or could you address that for, for a moment? Yeah, um, I'll go first. So I think one of the most important aspects um, from going from 45 to 55 is one of the key parts that we were missing is we would go over a concept and then just start um, either doing homework or just start to develop the concept on their own right. and we were done. And so by adding the 10 minutes as far as a, a normal class, um, it gives students time to interact with material right. while the teacher's there or their, their other classmates and so they can talk. Um, so that's going to be large as far as refining, right? Whenever we have a concept that comes out, it's new um, and it's, I can't remember if it's, I think it's John Milton Gregory in the Seven Laws of Teaching where he says it's, it's a beachfront, right? The new concept is just a beachfront and you hold it um, and they don't have time to dig in and keep advancing. And so what this will do is that get them past the beachfront and find obstacles or find understanding and say, do I understand this or not? Do we need some more clarification? So I think on a typical day, that's um, what we're excited about. And then the other one, as Matt said earlier, um, with labs, having more time um, with labs is one of our big priorities, uh, giving them that time to, to investigate, to mess up, to keep going and do real science. And by adding those 10 minutes, it just um, gives us a lot more time. Because by the time you start the lab and clean up your 10 minutes, and so 
um, we need as much time as we can get. So okay. that's that one's what I would say. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that's an excellent answer. I'm sticking to that. Yes, <laughs> we're in line. Good, good. Well, good. Well, if there are no other questions, um, we appreciate you sharing time with us today, and hopefully we've answered some of your questions in regards to the science program here at the Oaks. Um, we are continuing to look for ways um, to offer our, our students uh, more um, and, and a, a just a better approach. We want them to see science through the, the world of our faith. And so uh, we will continue to work um, toward that end. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. And thank you. if you are listening and you do have additional questions, don't hesitate to send those in through um, the email at the school and we will be happy to respond to those because we want you to, to have your, get your questions answered. But thank you again for being with us and God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right.